So now let's oh. ah, okay, po ito. So now let's talk about the features of grief and loss. So the experience of loss, uh, the, the experience of grief and loss shares much phenomenologically with depression. And their clinical differentiation is often challenging. The definition should not pathologize the experience of grief, constant grief, and other psychiatric difficulties in the context of grief. While diagnosing depression in a brief individual is a complicated process, a few phenomenological features are useful clues to the presence of depression. This includes self reproach in contrast to individuals with depression individuals who are grieving are able to retain an intact sense of self and maintain their sense of self-esteem and generally do not develop excessive guilt next is suicidality while bereaved individuals may experience a sense of indifference to life for a time after the loss this seldom evolves into suicidal ideation or intent Next is psychomotor retardation or agitation. Psychomotor agitation and retardation have been noted to be indicators of severe, indigenous, or melancholic depression and do not typically appear as physiological features of real. Psychotic symptoms. Individuals with auditory or visual hallucination should be evaluated for underlying psychotic process. Next is lack of reactivity. Many bereaved individuals will describe a marked loss of interest in their usual activities, but the complete absence of reactivity should be regarded as clinical. So the phenomenology of grief and loss include depressed mood, irritability, poor sleep, loss of appetite, loss of interest in usual activities, and anxiety symptoms such as panic attacks or obsessional thoughts. So Grief and loss problems are conceptualized in IPT as a resulting from two factors, both of which may be operative for the patient who seeks treatment surrounding a loss. The first factor is that the patient's social support system is not sufficient to sustain him through the loss experience. The second is that the patient may not be communicating his needs for support in a way that means others can respond effectively. In IPT, the therapist takes the temporary role of a support figure for the patient and forms a relationship in which the patient can describe and work through his feelings about the loss. While this process may take place in social relationships, it is often needs to occur first in the therapeutic relationship, particularly if the patient has the difficulty utilizing his social support system. Similarly, those patients who have a limited social support network may also need to use the therapeutic relationship in this situation. Now let's talk about exploring in the middle phase. So in exploring uh, in the middle phase, you see we usually clarify the circumstances, circumstances surrounding the loss, helping the patient describe his experience of loss and creating an environment of acceptance and connection with the therapies. Helping the patient tell the story of his experience to others to reduce isolation and facilitate connection. So that's what we usually do in the middle, uh, middle phase. So in the initial sessions, including the process of completing the interpersonal inventory, and more so during the middle session of IPT, the therapist must often rely heavily on clarification to help the patient better understand the circumstances of his loss. So when the patient is a market, markedly dysphoric or in distress state, the therapist should usually be less directive while encouraging more information and affect with empathic remarks. In contrast, if the patient's process affect is minimal, more directive questions about the circumstances surrounding the loss and his emotional reaction to it is quite helpful. So we can ask some question, no? We can ask, what has this loss been like for you? How were things with around, with, with the loss individual around the time they died? 
What are your feelings about the lost individual? And what are the most difficult things about the lost individual not being present anymore? So these are just examples of questions about grief and loss. So now we talk about clarifying the circumstances surrounding the loss. So as the patient clarifies and describes his experiences, he has the opportunity to begin to share this, those experiences with the therapist who serves in IPT as empathic and understanding and understanding. So the therapist literally steps into the role of a support person for the patient. One who can empathize, understand, connect with, or suffer alongside and be with the patient. The extension of this process is the critical second stage of dealing with grief and loss in IPT. So as the therapist should encourage the patient to begin to share the experiences or experience with others as well. The communication which occurs, the therapist sets the stage for the communication which occurs later in the patient's social relationships. In essence, um, the therapist. Um, so in in essence, the therapist is literally helping the patient to reconstruct the experience in a way that it can be communicated meaningfully to other people. So questions about the lost experience can be an example. How did you find out how that was like at the time? So this is an example of our questions about the loss experience. Next, uh, we will be talking about helping the patient describe his experience of loss. So the presence of painful and strongly felt emotion is for many patients the most distressing aspect of grief. So a patient's psychological coping mechanism and attachment style will moderate has clinically. One, the IPT therapy should not aim to overwhelm the patient. It, it is often helpful for the therapist to ask the patient to describe the experiences in order for the patient to experience the affect associated with the loss within the session. He will need to feel secure within the therapeutic relationship. The goal in IPT is not to make the feelings or the experiences go away, nor to resolve the grief, but to connect with others as we, as we share the human experience of loss and to find meaning in the connections. There is, sim there is healing simply in connecting with and telling to someone else who cares. Telling others, first the therapist and then the other people, is a way of gaining support and understanding of our experiences, of decreasing our sense of isolation, and of finding meaningful connection in our shared experience of loss. It is forming community with fellow human beings in the deepest sense. Because of this, the importance of developing a productive therapeutic alliance cannot be overstated. While recognition of grief and loss and the therapeutic techniques are all helpful, the therapist must establish a caring and empathic relationship with the patient. There is great value in helping the patient to describe his experiences of grief to an empathic and understanding listener. This is the therapist's primary task when working with grief and loss. So now we will be talking about creating an environment of acceptance and connection with the therapist. So both we have described a secure base effect in attachment relationship in which the sense of emotional security in the relationships allows an individual to explore and take emotional risks that might otherwise be difficult. So this is abs absolutely crucial in IPT and forms the basic for therapeutic alliance. All of the interventions used in IPT rests upon this foundation. So the therapist should be sensitive to the profundity of the loss for the patient. So some patients may have a very deep sense of grief to losses others may consider minimal. So as always in IPT, the therapist's job is to understand 
not to diagnose, minimize, or prematurely reassure the patient. So to minimize the importance of a loss, even with a well-meaning reassurance that things will get better or things will pass time, serves only to cut off the conversation and to severe understanding. It is not helpful for the patient. So helping the patient tell the story of his experience to others and to reduce isolation and facilitate connection. So as the patient begins the process of understanding and integrating his grief experience, um, the distress of being isolated is often the most, most difficult experience of all. So this is nearly always coupled with a sense that no one else can understand the depth of the loss nor the depth of the patient's personal experience with it. So the first step in IPT is for the therapist to literally step into this void and provide support and understanding to the patient. If this is done well, the experience of connecting with the therapist and feeling better understood should lead the patient to want more of the same outside of therapy. So the therapist can help the therapist can help the patient to initiate and develop new relationships that help to reduce that help to reduce isolation, fulfilling many of his emotional, physical, attachment, and social needs. No one can ever replace a loved one who is lost. There are no substitute. Each person is unique. Each relationship is unique. So the therapist must take care never to state or even imply to the patient that the lost person can be replaced. To do so will destroy any sense of empathic resonance that has been established. So dealing with anticipatory grief. So anticipatory grief and loss is not a diagnosis or category, but it may be used by some patient to describe the experience as they deal acutely with their own dying or for the inevitable death of others they love. Patients whose spouses or parents are disabled with progressing demanding illness or are dying of chronic or malignant diseases are examples of this kind of grief. So the loss and grief problem area is extremely appropriate to use as a means of focusing treatment and IPT on experiences like this, helping patients to cope with anticipatory grief issues, allow patients to describe and share the experiences with the anticipated loss that it is occurring. So there may, be, there may also be opportunities to discuss the upcoming loss with the person who is dying, giving patients opportunity to attempt to address interpersonal conflicts with the involved person rather than regretting not having done so. So when the anticipated death is caused by a process that allows the dying significant others to interact and communicate with the patient in a meaningful way, the patient can address the issues in the relationship that are conflictual, but in therapy and with the significant others, working to put emotional affairs in order. Many patients will value the opportunity to explore this aspect of the loss, and this clinical situation is often one of the most fertile grounds for achieving change in IQT. Now, let's talk about working with dying patients. So the IPT therapies can use the anticipatory grief approach when working with patients who are anticipating their own deaths. The goals are to help the patients enlist social support during the end stages of their illness and to communicate the experience to others. Further, creating a therapeutic relationship in which they can literally grieve their own anticipated loss is also ex extremely important. So in, in conclusion, in IPT, Grief and loss is broadly conceptualized. It includes reactions to a death, as well as anticipatory grief of others or of one's own death. Loss of physical health, loss of relationship as a result of divorce, and a myriad of other types of loss can be considered grief issues. As with the other problem areas, the primary point in IPT is to use the area to maintain the interpersonal focus of treatment rather than to make correct diagnosis. Listen to the patient and let him decide. It is after all his all, all his experience. So when working with a patient who is experiencing grief and loss, the therapist has two essential tasks. The first is to help the patient to begin to describe his experience 
including emotional reaction in particular. So this is done largely to the creation of a therapeutic relationship in which the experiences and feeling. The second task is to help the patient extend this process outside of therapy. So the development of so social support is crucial and can be encouraged by having the patient begin to share his experience of loss with others. So this ends for my presentation for the. Okay. Uh, we still have Sheng. Yes, but Doc, we will proceed with so, our last topic for Doc in IPT. Sige. Okay, let's proceed. Thank you, Megaphone. Thank you, Pat Doc. <clears throat> Kung ano lang yung matapos natin by nine. Oo, if we can finish it by nine, then we can continue it on the next meeting. Hello? Hello, hello. Uh, hello, can you hear me, Doc? Yes, yes, clear. Uh, I am using uh, Mekong's ano to, audio po. Sige. Okay. So, um, uh, so this morning we will be uh to continue we will be discussing concluding IPT. So uh these are the chapters uh actually we have three chapters to cover po for our discussion pero baka makatapos tayo ng one chapter lang for this morning session. So uh these are the topics and the chapters. So we will start with concluding acute and maintenance treatment. So um, acute treatment with interpersonal therapy, uh, psychotherapy comes to a conclusion, not a termination. In IPT, this does not signify the end of the therapeutic relationship. In fact, it is agreed that the patient and the therapist will have uh, therapeutic contacts in the future and uh, provision of uh, specifically provision is specifically made for this because uh, many of our uh, mga psychiatric disorders such as depression and anxiety disorders these are relapsing and remitting in nature so provision of IPT as a maintenance treatment after recovery from from depression or anxiety is helpful in preventing uh, relapse so conclusion at a termination so let's go to concluding acute treatment so in IPT uh, it is conceptualized as a two-phase treatment. Uh, merong acute treatment, uh, which focuses on resolution of immediate symptoms and distress, and a subsequent maintenance phase, which, which follows uh, it, uh, with the intent of preventing relapse and maintaining productive interpersonal functioning. So uh, there are reasons for keeping the acute uh, yung acute treatment uh, is uh, it's time limited and the time limit may be effective in generating change as it is hypothes hypothesized that having an endpoint in the acute treatment helps uh, drive the patient to work more rapidly on improving her communication skills and on building to a more um, effective social uh, network. So the acute time limit influences Acute time limit of the, the acute treatment, uh, it influences both the patient and the therapist to focus on acute symptoms rather than on personality change or change in attachment style. So as the relationship between the patient and therapist assumes greater importance over time, transference moves to the fore and becomes the focus of in IPT. In contrast to more psychodynamic therapies, the goal is to avoid dealing directly with transference if possible because it shifts the focus away from the patient's uh, social relationships. So while it is appropriate for the therapist to step in as a temporary attachment figure during a crisis, the point in IPT is to transition 
from support provided from the by the therapist to support provided by others as quickly as the patient can tolerate and manage it. So in conducting maintenance therapy, um, uh, IPT can be uh, conceptualized as a family practice or general practitioner model of care in which short-term treatment for an acute problem or, or stressor is provided until it is resolved and then maintenance or follow-up treatment is provided as needed. The relationship is ongoing, so the patient is welcome to return should another acute problem arise and is encouraged to return for a periodic health maintenance. So like uh, in our patients at the OPD. So uh, in IPD, once the acute crisis is resolved, the therapeutic relationship is not terminated. The therapist makes herself available to the patient if another crisis occurs at, uh, at which um, another time-limited course of acute treatment can be undertaken if may crisis again. So um, deciding when to conclude acute treatment. So in general, the best approach in IPT is to stick to the dosing range in uh, the treatment agreement that was collaboratively established at the end of the assessment or initial phase. And the most important reason for this is to maintain therapeutic integrity. The patient must believe that the therapist will follow through with what she agrees to do. Without this trust in the therapist, the therapy will fail. Um, on the other hand, the success of therapy is also dependent uh, upon the patient's belief that the therapist is absolutely committed to helping her and that her needs supersede nearly all other considerations, including a flexible agreement to conclude therapy after a particular number of sessions. So therapy is designed to benefit the patient, not the therapist. IPT should prioritize helping the patient instead of <clears throat> demanding a rigid adherence to a manualized protocol or uh, rigidly demanding that only the exact number of sessions agreed upon can be used. So there should be flexibility, clinical judgment, and common sense of the therapist should be used uh, to make such decisions. So it is uh, that uh, in, in the patient's best interest, the acute treatment can be extended naman. And then, so uh, here is an example, uh, a case example that illust illustrate the, the, the practical issues in uh, acute treatment. So uh, this is a case of Joe. Um, he is um, a 38-year-old man who came to treatment for a mild depressive episode, which he linked to the death of his father a year ago. Over the course of therapy, it became clear that despite a conflicted relationship with his father, Joe had maintained a mutually supportive marriage for of 14 years, had developed a reasonable social support network, and had been productive at work. Joe and his therapist agreed that at the end of the assessment to meet for about 12 sessions of IPT. So after making great progress in working through his grief, talking with his wife about his reactions to his father's death, and talking to a male friend who has uh, had also recently lost his father, Joe reported that his depression was essentially resolved and that he was doing well. So at uh, session 11, however, he requested that therapy be continued in, indefinitely as he had really enjoyed talking to the therapist and wanted to meet just in case uh, something else came up. So he began addressing the therapist by his first name. And then he also began to inquire about uh, the therapist's personal life, such as whether the patient, the therapist enjoyed fishing and other outdoor activities uh, Joe enjoyed. So while much transference grist for the mill was clearly developing, the therapist determined that Joe had benefited from the acute treatment as, and was functioning well. So as Joe and the therapist had not agreed to long-term intensive treatment, nor did Joe appear to need it to maintain his level of functioning, the therapist determined that sticking to the initial agreement 
outweighed the potential benefits of continuing therapy. So moreover, the therapist also recognized that continuing the therapy would involve a departure from IPT and a move to the more uh, psychodynamic transference-based therapy. So the therapist responded to Joe's personal inquiries with pleasant self-disclosure, indicating that he did uh, enjoy fishing and camping. So this comment was immediately followed by a statement from the therapist that such activities were clearly important to Joe and that it would be of benefit to think about other friends with whom Joe could share this, particularly as they would be a great way to continue to build meaningful interpersonal relationships. Thus, the therapist quickly shifted a potential transference encounter to a focus on continuing to develop interpersonal connections outside of therapy. The therapist also reiterated his opinion that it was best to stick to their therapeutic agreement, emphasizing that Joe had both done well in therapy and clearly had the ability to connect well with people. So at session 12, last session, um, Joe indicated that he felt ready to conclude the treatment. So the therapist responded by reiterating that Joe could return in the future if needed. They had already discussed the fact that the death of Joe's mother, among other events, might be a point at which he could return uh, uh, should his symptoms recur. So in this case, the patient's acute crisis has resolved and uh, the acute treatment was concluded. However, um, the, the therapeutic relationship is not terminated as the patient, the therapist makes himself available if ever the patient encounters another crisis he was instructed to uh, return. So, um, uh, let's go to the tactics in concluding acute treatment. So in addition to determining whether to conclude acute treatment, the therapist must also use clinical judgment to decide how to schedule sessions near the end of the acute phase. So the clinician should be guided by both clinical experience and empirical data. So clinical experience with IPT and other therapists uh, strongly suggest that the best clinical practice is to extend the interval between acute treatment sessions once the patient is in recovery, like what we are doing at the OPD. Uh, once our patients are uh, doing well, in-adjust natin yung intervals na mas matagal na siyang babalik. Uh, for example, rather than continuing to meet weekly, uh, for the duration of treatment, the patient and therapist may choose to meet bi-weekly or even monthly towards the latter parts of acute treatment if the patient had uh, recovered. So this will give them uh, the opportunity to further practice communication skills, reinforce the changes that they have made, and develop more self-confidence while remaining in a supportive relationship. So all of which facilitate better and more stable functioning. So these are the advantages in providing a more longitudinal care coming to a gradual gradual na conclusion in acute treatment rather than an abrupt termination. So first, there is less need to focus on the sense of loss that the patient may experience at the conclusion of treatment as the process is gradual rather than abrupt. So there are less problematic transferential issues that could arise. And second, the gradual conclusion more firmly fixes the therapist as a stable attachment figure while encouraging the patient to function independently. So the therapist should be available but not necessary for the patient. So instead of being terminated, Patients expect that they will be provided with help as long as they are suffering. So uh, the goals for, um, what are the goals for the conclusion of acute treatment? So uh, a good conclusion to uh, the intense therapy uh, relationship with the, which develops in IPT is 
of utmost importance, particularly the focus of treatment, uh, is the patient's relationships and communication with their primary attachments, one of whom at the conclusion of therapy is the therapy. So as a result of attachment styles, many patients will be sensitive to the conclusion of therapeutic relationship, even if it is not terminated, and will experience feelings of loss or possibly even rejection. Thus, handling the conclusion of therapy well is an essential task for the, for the IPT therapist. So the primary goals of IPT are symptom relief, improvement in interpersonal functioning, and increased social support. So a corollary of this is that the specific goals at the time of treatment conclusion are to foster the patient's independent functioning and to enhance a sense of competence. So this task is to help the patient, the task is to help the patient appreciate that she has resources and skills to manage problems and to squarely attribute therapeutic gain to the patient. So as the acute, as the acute treatment ends, the therapist should make clear that the patient has improved and has made changes and has the capability to function independently. So metaphorically, IPT follows the old adage, give a man a fish and he will eat for a day and um, teach a man to fish and he will eat for a lifetime. So ideally, patients learn new communication skills. They develop insight into how they communicate their needs and they establish a more functional social support networks or all in the service of improving the interpersonal um, functioning of the patient. So what are the key issues? the key issues in conclusion of acute treatment. So uh, the therapist should specifically discuss a number of issues to the patient prior to concluding acute treatment. So the most important of these issue is you, the, the discussion about maintenance treatment. Options, sorry. Options range from scheduling, um, maintenance sessions at monthly intervals for patients at high risk to concluding acute treatment with an agreement that the patient will contact the therapist should problems recur for those at low risk. So decisions about how to structure maintenance treatment should rely on clinical judgment of the, the therapist. And then another issue is the continued use of medication. So this should be also discussed with the patient. So physicians con conducting IPT can do this in the context of therapy. So other uh, mental health care providers should emphasize the need to continue medication. Even after, and the last is uh, with the patient is the recognition of early symptoms of recurrence, which may signal another episode of illness or a return of interpersonal problems. Therapists should explicitly discuss future events which may lead to relapse or recurrence. So this, uh, there are maybe future life events or stressors which patients are likely to have difficulties and uh, would benefit from maintenance treatment. So examples are a patient who had uh, difficulty grieving, the loss of a parent or a student having difficulty making transition to a university life. Uh, so they may have similar problems when beginning his first job. And so in IPT therapies should anticipate these potential problems in the future. So discuss them with their patients and the plan for treatment in the future uh, is discussed if uh, they arise. So now uh, let's uh, discuss techniques in conclusion of acute treatment. So several specific techniques can be utilized during conclusion of acute treatment as shown in this table. So in IPT two patients, as is genuinely possible. So as a specific summary of 
the positive changes that the patient has made in improving her communication and in developing a social support network should also be provided. So there is credit for change uh, that is given to the patient through, through the therapist has served as a coach. The patient has done the difficult work and has implemented the changes. It is also important to discuss the patient's reactions to conclusion of acute treatment. So these are usually quite positive is if sessions have been tapered as conclusion nears, and if the therapist makes clear that the patient can return in the future should the need arise. So uh, an iatrogenically created abrupt termination will lead to more difficulties at the termination of therapy. So even in cases in which the conclusion is handled well, however, the patient may have significant sense of loss, which should be directly discussed. The therapist should also feel free to use judicious self-disclosure when discussing at the end of therapy and can relate her personal feelings about concluding treatment, assuming that uh, the, 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 these are positive. So uh, therapist disclo self-disclosure of reactions serve three purposes. It further acknowledges the patient's experience of loss and it, it models the direct communication of feelings and it reinforces the patient's ability to connect in a meaningful way with others. So for example, in self-disclosure of her reaction, a therapist might state to her patient, I have really enjoyed working with you and will miss the interaction. I often find it difficult to conclude treatment with people to, with whom I work as I find myself feeling close to them and very invested in their success. So another helpful intervention when concluding is to ask for feedback from the patient regarding her experience in therapy. So asking for feedback is a great way of modeling, further encouraging the patient to do the same. So it also emphasizes the collaborative nature of the therapeutic relationship and reinforces the value of the patient's input to others. So in conducting maintenance treatment, uh, there, there are two primary differences between acute and maintenance IPT. The first uh, difference is simply quantitative matters. So maintenance IPT is less frequent and less intense and in some cases, the therapist may even choose to have maintenance sessions of shorter length. For example, a maintenance session, 20 minutes or half an hour uh, may be sufficient. So the other difference in acute and maintenance uh, therapy is qualitative, as the goals of acute treatment are to resolve interpersonal crisis, while the maintenance is to is designed to maintain functioning and prevention of uh, return of symptoms. So these are the goals of maintenance treatment. So the first goal is to, to review the patient's presenting problem and the progress that is being made. So the purpose is to is to the purpose of this is both to imply to the patient that she should continue working on interpersonal communication and to ensure that the problem has not resurfaced. So the second goal is, with, is um, to consider new problems that can be dealt with preventively. So the most common and gratifying is when patients bring new interpersonal problems to maintenance sessions after they have already started to resolve them. So for instance, a patient who originally presented with a marital conflict may bring a conflict with an employer to a maintenance session. So the therapist should use her judgment to determine whether resumption of acute treatment is needed if there are new problems. So the third goal is to continue to maximize the patient's interpersonal functioning. Uh, the in situation in which the patient uh, continues to function well, the therapist can help the patient to, to maximize and maintain this level of functioning with maintenance sessions. So the therapist should be strongly encouraging 
uh, and positively reinforcing and should encourage the patient to be as independent as possible. So lastly, um, to provide a continuing relationship for the resumption of acute treatment if needed. So these are the, the, the goals of maintenance treatment. As compared to the acute. So let's go to the tactics and techniques uh, in maintenance uh, treatment. So the basic techniques used in maintenance IPD are no different from those used in acute treatment. So the therapist stance should be slightly less active. However, as the, as the goal is to maximize the patient's independent functioning. So less activity in problem solving in particular is helpful and encouragement that the patient knows how to solve the problem is usually um is usually therapeutic as well. So let us take a look at this case vignette. Marinik po ako, Doc? Next thing is here. So here is a case example of uh, Mary. So Mary was a 28-year-old woman who presented for treatment following the death of her mother in an automobile accident. So her mother, who had been in good health, had been killed by a drunk driver about three months earlier. So Mary described increasing problems with low mood, crying spells, feelings of guilt, and poor sleep. Though she continued to function at work, she felt that the quality of her work had deteriorated. The incident that compelled her to seek treatment was her anxiety, about facing the driver of the other car for the first time at the upcoming trial. So Mary had no psychiatric history and described an unremarkable childhood. So she had been close to her mother and had last seen her two days prior to the accident. So she was able to relate a number of stories about her mother in great detail and seemed to have very balanced picture of her mother as a whole person. So Mary's father had been devastated by the death and Mary described having for the first time to care for her father. So she described him as somewhat distant but strong. He was always there when others needed help. So she had never seen him cry prior to the mother's funeral. And since then, he had been unable to go back to work. He appeared to be severely uh, depressed. And Mary had taken the role of caring for, for him. Uh, she noted at the initial session that she felt that her concern for her father had made it difficult to think about her own reactions to her mother's death. So Mary had one brother who lived some distance away and though they were not close, she felt that they had connected when he had returned for the funeral. He had, however, returned home, leaving her to care for her father. Mary had been married for about four years and described her husband as very supportive. Her husband attended an early session and left the same impression with the therapist. Her social support was good. She was very involved in church and had numerous friends at work and in the neighborhood. So as the interpersonal inventory and formulation took shape, the therapist began to conceptualize the case as one in which a high-functioning, relatively securely attached individual was faced with an overwhelming interpersonal crisis. So Mary's interpersonal relationships were good, so as shown in the interpersonal circle. So her insight was quite good, and she seemed securely attached in her relationship. So this is Mary's uh, formulation, the biological factor, social factors, no? and she had acute interpersonal crisis, the grief and loss about the mother's death, and the trial, which led to the distress. So Mary and her therapist agreed to meet for about 12 acute sessions of IPT with the goal of helping her to deal with grief and anxiety of the upcoming trial. Mary was able to make great progress. 
she was in touch with her emotions and could describe them in detail when uh, recounting her experiences with the news of her mother's death and funeral. So with the therapist's encouragement, she talked in a more detail about her feelings with her husband, then with several other close friends who were very supportive. Mary also arranged for psychiatric treatment for her father after having used role playing in the session to work out more fully how she wanted to approach her father. He was willing to go to treatment and appeared to be responding to antidepressant medication. She felt that she could be less physically involved in his care, in his father's care, and she began, and they began to talk about their experiences with their mother's death as well. So the most difficult situation was dealing with the driver who had killed their mother. After much discussion with therapists and with others, Mary elected not to have any communication with him. She did attend the court proceedings along with friends to for support, but did not feel that it would accomplish anything to have further contact after he was sentenced. She spoke with her pastor about the anger she felt about the event and her anger to, at God for allowing the accident to happen. Though she did not feel that she had resolved the spiritual question, she seemed to be comfortable with the ambiguity the situation had caused and continued her with her religious activities. So the therapy was conducted once weekly until after the court hearing and thereafter Mary requested that the therapy switch to once every two weeks. Since she was doing well and seemed to have supportive relationships, the therapist agreed and a new agreement was established to meet bi-weekly for the remaining five sessions. So toward the conclusion of acute treatment, maintenance treatment was discussed in detail. So it was mutually established at the end of acute treatment. Uh, Mary would return once monthly for two months and then would return in the future if she uh, needed to do so. Based on her solid attachments, social support, and lack of previous problems, the therapist was quite comfortable with this plan. So the maintenance sessions were unremarkable with the therapist simply reviewing Mary's general functioning with continued which continued to be quite good. And at the end of the second maintenance session, both agreed that there was no need to schedule further meetings. However, Mary did ask for the therapist's email address, stating that she frequently corresponded with people via email and could envision that email would be a nice way to stay in touch. So the therapist had two reactions to Mary's request. The first was a bit of anxiety and irritation at the fact that she had asked this at the end of the session. So there were obvious transferential implications to her request, which could not be addressed in therapy at this point. So the irritation was also in part due to the fact that the therapist had intense, extensive psychodynamic training and was literally itching to ask more about Mary's request. So the anxiety was largely because of the need for a rapid response when Mary asked for um, the, the email address. So holding the psychodynamic tendencies in check, the therapist based his response upon his second reaction. This reaction was that there was likely to be some therapeutic benefit in giving Mary a transitional object. So that was the email address, which she could keep as a concrete way of continuing to feel attached to the therapist. So the risks involved were minimal, and the benefits, great. First, the entire therapy had been conducted without uh, directly addressing the therapeutic relationship. Now, did not seem to be a good time to start. And second, uh, responding to her request in light of the fact that there were no future contacts planned would increase the likelihood that Mary would contact the therapist if she needed help. So finally, denying her request would risk being perceived as rejecting right at the end of the therapy and would be completely inconsistent with the supportive therapeutic stance that the therapist had maintained throughout treatment. So the therapist did not hear from Mary until about a year later when he received a short email with the news that she was doing well and that she and her husband were expecting their first child in several months. So the therapist replied with a brief personal note that he was glad to have heard from her, congratulated her, and wished her well uh, during the remainder of the pregnancy. A fleeting wish to ask Mary to write back after the delivery to update him about birth and her new child was 
crushed on the grounds that an old supervisor wouldn't have approved. But the therapist did recognize that this would also have been consistent with maintenance treatment in therapy. So about five months later, Mary called the therapist to set up an appointment. She had delivered a healthy baby boy but had experienced a profound sense of sadness several weeks after the delivery. Though she did not appear to be depressed, she described that the birth had reactivated feelings of loss regarding her mother. So she stated that she had not expected the reaction. But after the birth had she wanted her mother both be as well as to provide physical help to her. So a good friend of hers had recently also had a child and Mary felt somewhat envious about the fact that his uh, that this woman's mother had been there to help her for about two weeks after birth. Mary and the therapist agreed to meet for four sessions, during which, so once again, she was very articulate and was able to describe her emotional reactions and shared these with other friends in detail. And on a practical level, she invited her mother-in-law to stay for a week as she was making the transition back to work, which she felt was quite helpful even considering the fact that it was her mother-in-law. So the therapist made a point of asking Mary to bring her child to one of the appointments and spend quite a bit of uh, time simply enjoying the experience with her. He had the impression that this was tremendously valued by Mary. So with the second acute treatment phase concluded and Mary recovered. So Mary and the therapist agreed to continue the maintenance agreement as before. So I think this is my last slide for the first um, chapter, Doc. So in conclusion, in conclusion, for the though there are many similarities, acute acute treatment and maintenance treatment are conceptualized in IPT as two distinct phases of therapy. So the goals are different in intensity. So the goal of acute treatment is to resolve current uh, crisis interpersonal crisis and improve social functioning while the goal naman of the maintenance treatment is to prevent recurrence of symptoms while the techniques used in both are the same maintenance therapy generally allows the therapist to be less active and to encourage the patient to apply the problem solving skills that she has learned so every time the, the acute the, the acute treatment is not uh undoubtedly no uh, terminated, but it is concluded, concluded and uh, the therapist should make himself available uh, for, for if the patient needed, um, if the patient encounters distress, and then it is the, the IPT therapist who uh, decides if the patient needed to have an acute intervention or to continue the maintenance therapy. So that would be the end of the of the uh, chapter seven being photo. Okay, thank you, Sheng. Actually, the, the the very clear naman yung libro no the way I I understand it. Yes. So no very you know, simple, and then they have good examples. But siguro mm -hmm. sa sa next meeting na lang we'll ask no what is your insight regarding that. This didactics in the interest of time is already nine o'clock. Okay, so thank you, Sheng and uh, Nicole. We'll see you on Wednesday again.